Hello, uh, welcome everybody to Data Art Conversations with Sports Betting Industry Leaders. Today we are joined by Ursula Grosser, Director of Projects at BetMGM. Welcome, Ursula. Good afternoon, and, everyone. Hello. And as always, I'm joined by Kevin Twitchell and Matt Chats from Data Art. Uh, it's been a few weeks, but we are back. Took a little summer break. Um, so uh, we'll just jump right into it. Um, we have a lot of interesting questions uh, for Ursula, but you know, we'd like to start with uh, Ursula's story. So Ursula, tell us how and why uh, you made transition from finance to sports betting. We understand you spent a lot of years in finance and now you're at BetMGM doing some very interesting things. Uh, sure. So I would actually like to go a little bit further back in my story because so I was born and raised in Switzerland and I was always very interested in sports. So it was always a passion uh, of mine. And unfortunately, like at the time when I went to college, like there wasn't really sports business or sports management programs. So there was you could either study sports science, which it was like definitely not going to happen for me because I'm not I'm not going to do an undergrad in like medicine or biology or whatever. So I was always interested in the business aspect of it. So I basically went to college. I got a degree in um you know, business administration and information media technology management. And as you know, you are in Switzerland, banking is kind of like almost a logical career uh, start. So I joined the Swiss bank. And then after six months uh, or actually a year, I had the opportunity to move to New York for an assignment initially and then kind of stayed. So I've been in New York for over 12 years now. So and, you know, as you go advance in your career, you earn more money move around a little bit. So I had various jobs in banking. So in uh, in IT, as well as in HR. And eventually I was just kind of like, no, this is not really what I want to do. So long term, like really with my career. So I decided to eventually look for like a change and uh, applied to the Columbia Sports Management Program and decided to start that part time. So I basically Still worked in banking at BMP Bariba at the time and then, you know, started the program. And then about the year in, I actually was approached on LinkedIn. So I would say my switch to into sports betting was uh, probably coincidence at that time. And like it was literally like right place, right time. And at the time, like uh, it wasn't even better than GM. So it was uh, Roar Digital. So a new company, um, when I interviewed, there were about 25 people in the company. So I interviewed and at the time I was like, well, this sounds like a really great opportunity. Obviously, as part of the program, I knew that, you know, this is going to be big in the future. There is huge market potential. It's going to be an exciting industry. And that's kind of how I ended up at BetMGM. So I was employee number 30 or so. At the time, they were looking for a project manager to really kind of work on some joint venture activities and kind of start, you know, building to some of the project management function, basically, in the company. Wait, sorry, Ursula, that, that company became BetMGM? Yes. Okay. So we started out as a more digital LLC, and then about a year ago, we switched to BetMGM, which was from the beginning kind of our product name. So in the market, we were known as PlayMGM and then switched to BetMGM and eventually the company followed suit on that. Yeah. That's great. So with BetMGM, you know, because I think a lot of people think of MGM, they think of the casino, right? So when you sit around the corporate company, how is BetMGM broken off or how does it fit in the ecosystem of the casino versus the digital world? So we are a joint venture uh, between Intain, which is a, a UK, I'm not sure, headquartered, like UK based or European based gaming um, provider and MGM Resorts International. So we are owned 50% uh, by each of those parents. And we, but we are independent of those. So basically, um, we complement obviously the MGM retail business with our digital offering, which is, uh, you know, sports betting as well as iGaming, so casino and poker. Uh, and then additionally, like Entain uh, is basically our technology provider. 
So they have a long history and experience in basically providing online gaming. So again, sports betting and games, et cetera, and, and then more the retail side of it is MGM. And so do you have sort of active partnership with MGM or any other entity properties in terms of sort of driving customer acquisition or traffic or how does that work? Yeah, so I think that also makes it probably a little bit more unique compared to our competitors. So what BetMGM can offer, because obviously we have full access to uh, the MGM customer base in that sense. So we are obviously trying to drive, and that's part of our strategy, to drive basically customers from retail casinos to the mobile platform where available. Like we are currently live in 13 states with either or a mobile product. So where we have both, obviously, we are dry, trying to drive customers uh, to the mobile platform. So on the Intain side, they do not have brick and mortar casinos. So, and they are global. Mm -hmm. So they, they technically don't have a presence in, in the US. So BetMGM is basically their, their arm or their, their presence in the US. Yeah, and do they have other partners in, in Europe? Or they just do everything online? Uh, no, they're really focused on the online. So I'm not so familiar at this point how market access works in, in Europe. So like in Germany, as an example, if you have to partner with a brick and mortar casino as well, because uh, in the U.S., in most states, that's kind of a requirement, right? So we need to have a brick and mortar partner to be able to access the market. Mm -hmm. right. You know, you just touched on something. You said you're live in, in 13 yep. states. And that kind of probably falls under your job, that that whole integration uh, of onboarding a state. Now, I read somewhere that you guys hope to be in 20 the end of this year. Is that under your world? Is that in your world? And how daunting is that? And what does that team look like that you have to, to build to do that? Well, so, yeah, so that's one of my main responsibilities. So I'm um, responsible for um, basically the launch of new states from a project point of view. So what that looks like is basically um, we have project teams in, in place. So we, we work with like a, you know, project program organization. So we have, uh, you know, each area in the business has a stream that they own. And then obviously it depends really on, on the state that we basically mobilize that team and almost like a task force. So we come in uh, once the state legalizes and then basically start moving with various activities. You know, it starts from like licensing, compliance items, like technology, obviously, if you need to get a data center in each state, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's it's a variety of activities. And yeah, every state is different, right? So we have states where there is direct access. So basically we do not need a partner. So I mean, Tennessee is one of them. Uh, one of the new ones is uh, Wyoming as well. That's like direct access. And then we have states where, you know, only retail betting is available at the moment or what we call on property. So we have the capability to basically provide our partners with a retail sports book as well as an on property app, uh, which uh -huh. is fairly, you know, is a cost um, kind of lower cost and add some extra value for our partners. So which is a great solution for them. But to your question, yes, we are in 13s and yes, 20 is the goal. We are we are on track. So um, oh, wow, that's great. September 9th is a big deadline for us because if you have you know followed the market, obviously we know all the states like Arizona, Washington, South Dakota, Wyoming, like they all want to be live, right? By by right. NFL start. So oh, right, right, right. So so it's a deadline for us, yeah. And I know you said every state is different, but across the different streams, can you elaborate a little bit how much really is custom and unique in each one versus how much of the process or can you replicate from yeah. state to state? Well, I would say about probably 90 to 95% is probably the same, right? But then there, it's always like the details that are different. Like, you know, is it like, what license do we need? Do we need like we need a license in every state, right? But then there is some, is like some of our vendors need a license in others, 
the vendors don't need a license, occupational licenses. So for the people who basically provide customer service, right? They need a license in some states, they don't need a license in other states. So licensing is a big piece that's again, fairly similar. And then um, other items like, you know, marketing, we have a strategy that we basically replicate in every state. From a technology point of view, I say, again, it's probably even 99% is the same. Like there are some differences, um, as you might know, it's more around some have like bed limits in place or like, uh, you know, like some specifics around lookout or you can, you know, like just some more feature differences, but not particularly like big differences when it comes to like really the build out of the app. And, you know, all everything else, again, it's it's more or less the same. We need a bank account in each state, right? <laughs> so like, just like the, the basics on how we, we do business or we need a business license in each state. So again, about 95% across the board is probably the same. And and if the app can only be used on site, if you're in a state where that versus it's standalone and it can be direct, does that have implications for you in terms of the build or that's more just from a user experience? The user has to be on site versus they don't, but it's kind of the same app experience. Uh, well, so we we actually have two different app apps in market. So our Nevada app experience is very different than let's say you're in Michigan. So it's because it's a different technology. Um, so we we are using uh, called stadium technology in Nevada, and that's our solution for on property as well. So it's kind of a lighter lift and and just tech stack than like our full fledged uh, Intain app, basically. And stadium is your internal sort of proprietary name for your, or that's a, that's a commercial application. Uh, it's not a, it's our, so it's, it's, so stadium company is hundred percent owned by Intain and we at BetMPM uh -huh. basically using that technology and then the Intain technology is, is also our BetMGM technology. So it's, it's both pro proprietary, but stadium, the difference is they, they do a B2B business as well. So they have a lot of clients in Nevada itself, as well as in, in Colorado, where we're basically selling the software directly to the to the uh, casinos as well. And it's the it's the retail solution. So the stadium is the retail solution that has an addition of an app, but it's basically it's just an extension of the retail experience in that sense. And is, is there a complexity with with the leagues that you have relationships with too? Like in a certain state, like if you were in <clears throat> New York with the Yankees or the Rangers, if we ever go, like you know, how does that work with with the leagues? Um, I I'm not so familiar with that aspect, like because we generally because the app is the same in every state, so we okay. generally the deals we have with the league. Like with all the leagues that we have deals with are basically across the board uh, the same. Right. Like it's more about using their logos in the, like right. in the app, like things like the that. licensing. Right. So. Exactly, yeah. it's more the licensing piece than anything else. So, yeah. yeah. In terms of entering new markets, just a a couple of questions. Uh, one thing you touched on um, was the the marketing piece, where uh, part of your strategy when entering new market. Um, is actually, you know, uh, advertising and marketing to that specific stage. Um, and uh, I, I know it doesn't fall completely under your umbrella, but you intersect with it. But uh, does BetMGM craft like unique marketing programs based on the state or, or it's just kind of one? No, no. So obviously, like we cater towards that market, right? So like Michigan, um, they are really big on gaming as well. So there is more like marketing that's cross-selling between like sports and gaming. Like they're really big on casino games, right? Mm -hmm. And then obviously we have partnerships with some of the, like Pittsburgh Steelers. So like in Pennsylvania, we are obviously more driving like some of the, the promotions we do are more driven towards that market. And then Denver Broncos is another one, right? So so basically, we definitely adapt marketing to like the states and what kind of people want to see, because we obviously based on data, we do see that 
some states favor more either a tep, uh, bed type or they favor a team or et cetera. So we are catered, catering towards that, definitely. But then we have more like nationwide um, uh, campaigns like, you know, the Jamie Foxx one that you might have seen, like that. Yeah, the King yeah. that's a more national. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the one that we are basically using everywhere. Um, we do also like one big piece of um, our strategy is we want to be first in market, right? That's that's our goal. So on day one, minute one, we want to be there. So and it, obviously there is a big run or a big competition around all our competitors and, and us to get like the customers, right? So, I mean, FanDuel, DraftKings, we know they kind of have an advantage because of the daily fantasy, they already have a customer base, et cetera. So one thing we really try to do is also around pre-registration. So as soon as we are allowed from a regulatory point of view is kind of pushing, start pushing out marketing and having customer registering basically. So they already have an account with us and hopefully money with us. <laughs> so they, yeah. they're gonna bet on like day one. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, just one, one more question. Yeah. In, in terms of uh, <clears throat> going back to like entering new markets, um, like you said, 90% of it is, is you know, in, in terms of preparing and deploying uh, is, is similar. Um, but that 10% that is different and that 10% can mean, you know, a matter of, uh, you know, weeks to, to months in terms of timeline. Uh, a state like like New York, right, where, where you know, betting, sports betting has been approved, mm -hmm. is going through its process. I'm not even sure what's happening right now. Um, but one, one thing that uh, I understand they decided to do was to do it through the lottery. Now, does, does that like overcomplicate your job? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't like for us, like, you know, when we look at the sta at, at states and regulators, like there is always going to be a reg regulator, right? If it's going to be a gaming commission or a regulator, I think it, it probably doesn't matter that much. Okay. Like, I think in my opinion, where it gets complicated is when certain aspects are managed by the lottery and certain are ma managed by the gaming commission, right? So, and then they have different opinions about products, right? As we are, you know, we want to be very, uh, like come out with new products that none of our competitor have. And then we have to go like, obviously to the gaming commission, get approval. And then if the lottery has object objections against that, then that's a problem, right? So I think that where it become, becomes complex in that world, but if it's the lottery versus the, the a gaming commission doesn't really matter. Like as long as, you know, there is like co collaboration because they, they're all going to have rules, right? They're going to have rules and, yeah. and, but in the end, they're all human, right? So it's all about dialogue and finding a way on how you work efficiently with them. Is it possible at all? One might think that the lottery would just be a little more difficult only that they might view it as, as more of a competitor that you're yep. competing for user dollars right. in a way that if it's a commission or a right, strictly a regulatory body, you're not competing for the consumer dollar. And, and that's exactly the point when, you know, the lottery has a competing product. So like, you know, in some states, the lottery operates a sports betting. Like, I think Oregon is one of those, the where the state actually has, the lottery has a sports betting product. So that's also where they are, why they are opposing a statewide mobile solution for others, right? So I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky, but yeah. Okay. Can we jump in for a sec? I wanted to ask a little bit about data analytics. So, for example, when you were talking about, you know, in Pennsylvania, you have a partnership with the Steelers. So maybe you're doing more sports or football themed marketing campaigns or you're trying to figure out, you know, how, uh, you know, retail casinos convert to mobile, et cetera, or which is more of a market for gaming versus sports. All of the above, all the kind of CRM and the engagement what do you build? What do you use in terms of database, data analytics? Like, how's that whole system working for BetMGM? Well, it's, it's a good question. A little bit out of my wheelhouse, but <laughs> obviously uh, we have extensive data, right? So, like, everything you do on the app is in a way tracked. Like, we know who bets on what and how much and et cetera, right? So uh, we, we and this is a big effort for us to build out like the, the BI department, et cetera. So we, um, 
I mean, yeah, it's all based on data. Like, uh, I, I can't really say a lot of, you know, I don't have a lot of more details just because uh, I'm not so close to that. But, you know, it's literally all, it's everything is data driven, like which promotions we got to run and, and you know, like, and also like, interestingly enough, uh, some work better in some states and some in others, right? Or some are just not being picked up by the customer. Like, again, this is still a new industry. So we are still learning and, and we are evolving. So, yeah. Yeah, we like any conversation around data. That's why we put it in our name. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I think my, yeah. my, my role is just a, less, a little bit uh, less data-driven and more like, okay, how can we just put all the puzzle pieces together so we get to a, like, a, a product in the end? So, yeah. And actually, that is a good brings up a good question. Let's say you have multiple states going live, and as we said before, you're going from 13 to 20 in months. Um, do you have multiple teams, one assigned to each state, or the same team is trying to parallel track, knowing that a lot of what they do is usable, you know, reusable? Yeah, so I think well, the way it works is generally, so I have, uh, in my team specifically, I have multiple PMs. Um, that obviously we need a, one dedicated PM for one, one uh, state. Um, but what we do try is, again, it, it varies uh, a lot by product, right? So like Arizona is a very different product launch than South Dakota or Wyoming, right? So it depends if it's a retail deployment, if it's a retail and mobile deployment. So I think we have tried to, to organize a little bit by that. But then, you know, we generally have one compliance, one licensing person. So it's very... It's unfortunately very, um, you know, focused in key people. And then as we grow, obviously, that's one thing to more kind of like broaden that team of like who does state launches. So it, it's it's uh, it's challenging a little bit, but obviously we do have the depth in the like the the people available. It's just kind of like we generally have experts because again. We were 150 people last year. This year we are 650. So we are we are kind of all learning together. So that's great. You yeah. know, your story is inspiring. You know, as you know, coming from finance, being a female in the sports betting world. So you know, what are you saying to up and coming smart women that want to get into? The, you know, as you're looking at recruits and building your team yeah. in this once male dominated world. You know, do you have a recruiting process where you're maybe targeting, you know, some smart women like yourself to to join the team and to be leaders in in this industry? Uh, I think we are not quite there yet. I mean, and the reason I'm saying that, so it's it's challenging. So, so my world is also very different than the rest of of the company, right? So, generally, I'm look what I'm looking for is either someone who has very strong PM skills. Right. So it doesn't really matter. Like, I, I don't care if they have gaming experience or not, or then it's really I'm looking for very strong gaming experience. Right. So so because the, the roles I have are highly complex, like working at the senior level at the in the organization, et cetera, managing, again, multiple streams like complexities, et cetera. So. So what, what I'm really, um, you know, try to do is and inspire by is kind of leading by example, right? So obviously I, I do have also as part of the sports management program, like I have these conversations about opportunities again, and my role is more project management, but then there is marketing, obviously there is data, there is HR. So this industry has everything, right? That you're looking for in a way. And, you know, ultimately it's, it's, yeah, the more women, the better, right? But it, it's also, I mean, if they're good, right? And, right. and kind yeah. of like, ultimately, it's a little bit, hey, I help everyone who who wants this, because I also think it's not for everyone. Like where the industry is right now, it's, it's challenging. Like it's, you know, I call it a little bit wild, wild west at times. So right. Right. like, it's a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of like, you know, changing priorities, changing in like, you know, like everything can change from one day to the other just because there is so much growth and there is such an aggressive case. 
like the paste is another thing, right? So for me, it almost, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, it's more really about the, the, the attitude and yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, if, if you want, I'm happy to mentor. I'm, I'm here to support, right. and, you know, so, so that's a little bit where I see it, you know, it, and yes, there are not a lot of women at the top right now. When you look at the more the mobile space, I think um, in the, in the retail and and it's it's yes they have except especially in Vegas like it has been a long standing industry like you can see that there are a lot of female like executives etc which is amazing and I think in the mobile world that's still like we have some ways to go on that. That's interesting though because when you're describing the culture and who would enjoy it and who would succeed in it. What I heard a lot of is you were kind of describing startup culture, and I've worked in a few startups. So I wonder when you're actually, or, or your HR folks are recruiting for talent, do you really try to position it as, hey, if you're the sort of person that wants an entrepreneurial experience and come shape an industry and come work in a startup environment, don't be thrown off by MGM being in the name. We're really a startup. Yes. This is an exciting place. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Because I mean, we are a startup, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think you know. Yeah. Probably, if you talk to FanDuel <laughs> and DraftKings, it's different, right? Because they have been around a little longer than us. But again, I said I started mid March 2019. We were 30 people. Last summer, we were about 150 uh, around the start of COVID, or like in summer. And now we are probably, I said, 650. 650 before we are probably close to 700 now so like again the, the pace and growth is is incredible and there is like you need to have the right attitude to be successful in this environment and definitely like you know that's what we test more than knowledge because how much sports betting knowledge is actually out there already right so it's you don't find a lot of people with a lot of experience unless you go and and uh, recruit from like Europe or so. Yeah, because yeah, the market is so so new here. I mean, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Now, now, you mentioned like, you know, I'm sure every project has its own challenges, but what are some of the kind of, from a management perspective, mm -hmm. you know, in your position as a, as a director, like what are some of the, uh, maybe not daily challenges, but overall challenges that you encounter, you know, throughout a quarter, you know, a year or longer? <laughs> well, I, I think really the... The biggest challenge for us is, and as we are going into, especially this time right now of the year where everyone wants to be ready by NFL, right? So, and the, the biggest challenge is the uncertainty around regulations and what is it that the regulator wants us to do in the end, right? Because mm -hmm. like, and I just pick on Arizona, don't mean to pick on Arizona, but it's just the one that's, that's uh, especially challenging right now. So they, they legalized, I would say about three or three and a half, four months ago, right? So they came out very early and said, we're going to launch on September 9th. That's, that's what they came out. Like the final regulations were available last week. So as you can imagine, like uh, an app development cycle probably takes a little bit more than eight weeks, right? So, <laughs> so th I think that that alignment between requirements, obviously our ability to deliver, and then you know making sure that we understand what we can and not can and cannot do. Like I mentioned, pre-registration before. So initially they they moved it by two weeks, right? So just last week as well. So there is just like this, again, uncertainty of like even is September 9th now going to happen or not? Like there is still a chance that they, they, it's going to slip, which I don't assume, but, you know, they want to be live from day one. But I think that's one of the biggest challenges for all the state launches if it's a newly regulated market. And the other one is, you know, for the regulator also to work through like, again, what are their rules? because there are a lot of questions that are not def defined in the rules. So there is a lot of room for interpretation. So, and I think just getting like the right answers to make sure that we can we are compliant with the rules because if we are not, then we, you know, potentially miss a launch date, right? Which is, which we can't. So I think that's really like, the, it's just the environment that we are in. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. The other things is just like, I think housemaid, in that sense, self-inflicted ones where we just 
as a company just need to improve and get better internally, like around, you know, communication and alignment. And, you know, there is always the occasional kind of like, oh, I thought we speak about this state. No, like we are talking, you know, because there are so many conflicting states that are happening at the moment. So, yeah. So I think those are kind of the things. Following up on the first of those, is it do all operators that want to be in the state get the regulatory information at the same time? Or is everybody trying to get like kind of access to what is going to be in the regulation early so they can get a, an advantage by building early? Yeah, I, I think it's both, right? So generally, um, the process is around, so they, they release draft regulations and then it's a, you know, a period for comments and then there is another release and then another period for comments. So, and then obviously like everyone has their lobbyists. Um, we have ours, you know, they have theirs. Um, and then obviously we have people in, in compliance that, you know, have some personal relationships, maybe, you know, so, yeah. I mean, everyone is looking for that little, you know, kind of nugget of information that allows that to, to be, you know, faster in the market, et cetera. That the only thing I would say though is we have seen like some of the jurisdictions that have legalized more recently, they are fairly strict in like, well, we are not meeting with you till we you submitted your application or we are not giving out the information on this till date X. So they, they have become more stricter in like how they share information, et cetera, because I think the marketplace has also become more competitive. Right. I guess that's a great example of how it starts as the Wild West and slowly it gets a little more standardized and uniform as you go through, roll out more markets. Well, the, the only thing I would say is, though, like, you know, Jersey is a market that has been around for a very, very long time. Right. Very established sports betting. Um, and they are very strict. So we do see a lot of the newer states are adapting a little bit more flexible rules and are a little bit more on the you know, like kind of a little bit more receptive for, for like things that are maybe a little bit different. So, yeah. Interesting. Thanks again, Ursula. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Weekend. Great to talk. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Oh, now we, now we got to change, change our drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although you never, you'll never know what was in here all day. <laughs> all right. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye everyone.